let me begin by telling you that here we are. This is the year of 2012. In the year of 2014 will be the 100th anniversary of the great revival that broke out in Athens, Ohio that started people all over North America baptizing people in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In preparation for getting there and in expectation of another great revival with thousands of people being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, I come to this pulpit tonight to preach to you a message that complements that particular incident and happening. Would you open your Bibles to Hebrews the 10th, the 11th chapter? Hebrews the 11th chapter and the 10th verse. They're going to put these on the screen for us. For Abraham looked for a city which hath foundations and whose builder and maker is God. And then share with us Genesis, the third chapter, verses 22, 23, and 24. The Bible says, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. And the next verse says, so he drove out the man. And he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. But in the book of John, the 14th chapter, verses 1 through 5, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Now I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am there you may be also. And if I and I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Say that with me. How can we know the way? Look at this. The Bible says in Jeremiah in, in Acts the third chapter, Acts three, verses twenty and twenty-one. It said that he'll send you Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heavens must receive until the times of the restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all of his holy prophets since the world began. Jeremiah 50 and 5 says this. I love this. They shall ask the way to Zion. Everybody say, ask the way to Zion. They shall ask the way to Zion. Job said this, and this is why he was going to Job. In the book of Job, Job the 23rd chapter, verse number 3. Job 23 and verse 3. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. Verse 8, 9 and 10 says this. Behold, I go forward, but he is not there, and backward, but I cannot perceive him. Verse 9 says... On the left hand where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand that I cannot see him. And verse number 10 says, But he knoweth the way that I take, and when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Now, just just let me capture all of these verses of Scripture real quick. Number one, Abraham looked for a city. And he looked for that city because ever since Adam and Eve had been put out of the garden, Ever since that day, Abraham, Jeremiah, the disciples, John, they've all been looking for the road that leads back to the garden. Ever since that man's been put out of the garden, they've been looking for the way back to Zion. They've been looking for the way back to that city. They've been looking for the way back to that garden. Would you just bear with me for about 22 minutes? And let me preach to you tonight the road back to the garden. I'm preaching to you this evening the road back to the garden. God bless you. You may be seated. Let's get the picture. To the north with the Pison, to the south with the Gihon, to the east with the Hydekel, and to the west with the Euphrates. 
This was the four rivers that surrounded the Garden of Eden. And this man, Adam and Eve, the reason they're put out of the garden is because they have confronted God and they said, God, we're naked. And then he said, what have you done? Now, you don't understand why they're naked until you go over in the New Testament and you meet with Jesus Christ and Elijah and Moses on the top of Mount Tabor. And when you get to the top of Mount Tabor, you understand then how it was that Adam and Eve makes the statement, we're naked. Because Adam and Eve was made in the image of God. And the image of God incorporated not only the attributes that we know of God, but also there was present there the glory of God. On the top of Mount Tabor, you see Jesus Christ and Moses and Elijah, and they are clothed from the shoulder down with flowing white, sparkling garment. They were clothed in the glory of God. When Adam and Eve in that Garden of Eden transgressed, ate of that fruit, did whatever it was that didn't cooperate with God's perfect will at the tree of knowledge, they were uh, suddenly, they lost the glory of God because they had allowed rebellion and sin to come in to their life. And when that glory of God dissipated, there they stood naked. Now, when God comes by and they make this confession, the very next thing that has to happen is they can't live in this garden because the tree of life is there. And if they eat of that tree of life, they can live forever. And not, God didn't want anybody to suffer eternity unrighteous and out of the step with God. So out of his mercy, he put them out of the garden. Obviously, when God put them out of the garden, he set them on the other side of the river. So they lost the glory of God. And then they were set on the other side of the river. The next thing that God does is God slays an animal. And slaying those two animals, he slays them, sheds their blood in order to clothe Adam and Eve and to cover up their transgression. And so God put them out of the garden. Let's, let's see what happened. The first thing that happened, they lost the glory of God. The next thing that happened, they were put on the other side of the river. And the next thing that happened, there had to be a sacrifice slain. Blood was shed so that they could clothe them and put them back in a state of innocence or at least in a state of modesty. Now, let me show you something. That's how they came out of the garden. Now, the road back in. Well, first, let me tell you this. There, you, the way in all depends on the way that you're, where you're standing looking at it. Let me show you how it works in the Bible. There was a prophet by the name of Daniel. Daniel in his prophecy, he looked down through the telescope of time. As he looked down through the telescope of time, he saw the kingdoms that would come to this world. And so he saw them in this order, and they were representative of them. And uh, the names of the kingdoms, of course, would be Babylon. And, and then after the Babylons would be the Medes and the Persians. And after the Medes and the Persians would be the Greeks. And after that, of course, would be the Romans. But as he saw them, and he looked down through the telescope of time, he saw a lion, and then he saw a bear. And after that, he saw a leper. And after he saw the leper, he saw a great and a terrible beast. Well, that's the way Daniel saw it, because that that was where he was standing, looking and what he had to say. But when John the Revelator came along, he writes about it and he's looking the other direction. Brother Garrett, as he looks at the other direction, he writes about a great and terrible beast. He writes about a leper. He writes about a bear. And then he writes about a lion. Because the perspective that you're viewing from determines what you see and what sequence it comes. Let's see if we can get this right. If Adam and Eve were put out of the garden in this order, they lost the glory of God. They had to cross the river. And then there was a lamb slain to cover their sins. Then obviously, if you're going to go back into the garden, you're going to have to go back into the garden the opposite of the way that you came out. And the way back into the garden is you're going to have to have a, a lamb slain. You're going to have to go through the water. And you're going to have to have the restitution of all things. And that includes the glory of God. As you look at it like that, God sees the pattern himself. And so God begins to set forth the way for the road that leads back to the garden. Adam and Eve leave the garden. After they leave the garden, the things degenerate so in society that they get down to the place that this is what God does. God gets down and he repents forever making man. But after God repents for making man, God sends a flood of water and he washes the world. 
world. And after he sends that flood of water and washes the world, he takes them out as far as Bethel, out of this place called Babel. And he gets them to Babel. And when he gets them there, he gives them all a new language. I think I see something beginning to form in the picture here. You see, they are called the fathers of the Hebrew nation. They're called Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Let's see what happens to them. Abraham slays an animal on the top of Mount Moriah. And then his son Isaac comes along and digs the wells of water. And then Jacob comes along and has this experience in the glory of God at this place called Bethel. Now we're beginning to see the picture. God's got a pattern that he's going to follow. And so it is, it's time for the children of Israel to come out of the land of Egypt. And to come out of the land of Egypt, he says, here's how I'm going to get you out of Egypt. We are going to slay the Passover lamb. I am going to take you through the Red Sea. And after I take you through the Red Sea, I'm going to visit my glory upon you on the other side of the Red Sea. Anybody feel like saying praise the Lord? And so the day comes that he now has got them out and he brings them to Mount Sinai and he says, I am going to build a tabernacle. But before you build that tabernacle, come here, Moses. I want you to come up on the mountain with me. I'm gonna show you the pattern of how this thing's gonna work that I've already laid out in heaven from before the foundation of the world. So he shows him a lamb that was slain from before the foundation of the world. He shows him a crystal sea and then he shows him the throne of God and the glory of the Lord. Moses comes off of that mountain and he starts building a tabernacle. When he gets down to build the tabernacle, he builds a brazen altar for death. He builds a labor of water for the washing and he builds the holy place that will hold the glory of God. Somebody said praise the Lord. All of this is looking farther through time. You see, the day is coming that Jesus Christ, the revelation of God, is about to walk into the world. And as he comes down, he shows up one day beside the Jordan River. John the Baptist is standing up to his waist in water. And he turns around and he says, Ladies and gentlemen, behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. And that lamb says, I need to be baptized. John, John said, oh, I need to be baptized of you. I'm not worthy to bear your shoes. I'm baptizing indeed under repentance, but you're gonna baptize them with the Holy Ghost and fire. But Jesus says, John, for the fulfillment of all righteousness and for the perfection of this will that I am working in this world, you need to baptize me. So here he is. The lamb of God is taken out in the Jordan River and he is baptized in water immediately when Jesus breaks the water the Bible says the heavens open God starts talking this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased and the Holy Ghost descends upon him let me see if I got it right it takes a lamb it takes water and it takes the Holy Spirit coming down Jesus Christ comes to do the passion of Christ and he repents in the fashion of the Garden of Gethsemane, surrenders himself to God, and he goes to Calvary and Golgotha, and there he dies. It took a lamb being slain. And the lamb that was slain was then taken and put in a grave, buried there. And after he was buried there for three days and three nights, behold, he comes out. And when he is resurrected, the glory of God is upon him. In fact, for the first time, everybody say the first time. The first time he is legitimately referred to as Lord is in the presence of the man who is the doubter. But he makes the declaration of the Godhead beyond question. He says to Jesus Christ, my Lord and my God. It was Peter that recognized it and said it like this. This Jesus whom you have crucified, God has raised from the dead and made him both Lord and Christ. It's that Lord that the Apostle Paul, when he's called Saul of Tarsus, is on his road to Damascus and he's knocked down in the street. He looks up to that bright light and he addresses the Lord. Now remember, Paul is a Pharisee of the Pharisees, born of the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised the eighth day and knowing the law from beginning to end. Knowing the first statement of the law is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord and him only shalt thou serve. Knowing that the psalmist wrote it clearly, the Lord he is God. And so 
so lying there in the dust, he looks up at heaven and says to that one from heaven, Lord, he knew it was God. Who art thou? And he speaks to him, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. And so, so Jesus Christ is resurrected to fulfill the plan of God. So now the scripture says, after his resurrection, he is called Lord. And after his resurrection, it is written, it pleased God the Father that all the fullness of the Godhead dwell in him bodily. Well, that's the way it is. Now, it's time for the church to start. There's a simple question asked. All of these people, after Simon Peter preaches that message, and he tells them, this Jesus that you've crucified, God's raised from the dead, made him both Lord and Christ. The Bible says that they were pricked in their hearts. And then they realized how hard it was with the pricking in the heart to resist it. And they looked up and they said, men and brethren, what must we do? The apostle Peter is about to tell them, yes, sir, I'm going to give you the road map for the road That'll lead you back to the garden. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Oh, preacher, that was just for those folks back then. Uh Uh-uh. Peter's not finished talking. For the promise is unto you. That was those present. To your children, the next generation that hadn't even been born yet. To those that are afar off, the folks that live in Huntington, West Virginia. We're about 9,000 miles away. That's a pretty good trip from Jerusalem. But then he says something all-inclusive of the globe. He said, even as many... As the Lord our God shall call. That's why he said be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Now now get the picture. You see this was very, very simple because in the tabernacle you must remember something. That there was an angel with a flaming sword that was put at the eastern gate. You got that picture? Well, whenever that any Jewish person came to the temple or the tabernacle, in fact, that's what makes the the song, I'll meet you in the morning, just inside the eastern gate over there. The reason that is so important is everybody that approached the temple of the Hebrew constituency, they had to come in the temple through the eastern gate. And when they came in the eastern gate, they are looking at the the temple. And if you're looking at a map of it, you are seeing them come in the east and they travel to the west. Because in the east end of the temple is where the brazen altar was. In the west end of the temple is where that the Holy of Holies was. And that's the reason the scripture is written. He has separated our sins behind our back as far as the east is from the west. That's a reference to the atonement message of the blood. All right? Now, when you see this like this, you, you, you want to find out something. You see, when the folks that are Samaria, who are part Jew and part Assyrian, when those people at Samaria come to God, look how they come to God. They repent of their sins. They are baptized in water in the name of Jesus Christ. And, and John and Peter came down and laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. Okay, you got that? We have a Jewish group that's over here in the land of Ephesus. Twelve disciples of John the Baptist. They are Jewish. And when we meet them there in in Acts the 19th chapter at Ephesus, you'll find out something. They have all repented because they were disciples of John who came preaching repentance for the kingdom of God is at hand. And then Paul looked at them when he met those disciples and he said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said, we have not so much as heard if there be any Holy Ghost or not. And 
Paul said to them, well, what were you baptized to? And they said, well, we were baptized unto John. And Paul said, John merely baptized you under repentance, saying that you should believe on him that it should come after, that is on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were all baptized in water in the name of Jesus Christ. Then Paul laid his hands on them, and they all received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Get the picture? They are coming from the eastern gate. They are going past the brazen altar. They are going to the labor of water. They are going into the holy place. But we have got a gentleman here by the name of Cornelius. And, and let me tell you, I, I'm telling all of this to you tonight because water baptism is absolutely necessary. You know, I have got four places in the Bible where it references them receiving the Holy Ghost and speaking in other tongues. That was sufficient tonight for almost one billion people in the world through the charismatic ranks to have received the Holy Ghost and speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives the utterance. But I have got 90 verses of scriptures that references water baptism and a plethora of them that says it should be done in the name of Jesus Christ. Now get the picture. Get the picture, friends. Here it is. What about this character by the name of Cornelius? Cornelius, everybody still with me? Cornelius is a good man. He has built a monument in heaven with his tithes, his alms, and his offerings, and his prayers. Not many folks have built a monument in heaven in front of God by praying and giving. But Cornelius did. And God sent him an angel one day, and he asked the angel, what else do I need to do? And he told him to send over to Joppa to the house of Simon the Tanner. And there's one there by the name of Simon Peter. Have him to come over. He'll tell you all you need to do. Now, Jesus is preached by the man called Simon Peter. He comes on and he preaches to them in the book of Acts, the 10th chapter and the 43rd verse. And he said that remission of sins is given to everyone that believeth in the name of Jesus Christ. The next verse says, while Peter spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them and they began to speak with other tongues as the Holy Ghost gave the utterance. Now, notice. There is no record of repentance. He just believed. Are y'all still with me? But they received the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues. Then Peter looked at them and he says to them, Can any man forbid water? Seeing that these have received the Holy Ghost even as we. And so they took them and they commanded that they all be baptized in the name of the Lord. And after they were baptized in the name of the Lord, they went to Peter and asked him to dwell with them certain days after that. But here's the question. Why was it that Cornelius' household didn't go the same direction as it was for the Jew? I'm going to tell you a little secret. When you look at a map, maybe you have one in the back of your Thompson Chain Reference Bible. Maybe you have a Schofield. Maybe you just have a world Bible that's got a picture of the map of the temple in it. If you will look at that map, you will notice something. In that map, on the south side of the temple, there is a place there called the Court of the Gentiles. South, north, west, east. Let me turn around and do it for you. South, north, and then it would be west and east. You get the picture? That's what you've got. Now, as they approach it, you've got to remember something. All the Hebrews do their reading from the right to the left and so as they make their progress of time they always come to the temple through that eastern gate they always go to the laver of water or the brazen altar then they go to the laver of water and then there in front of them is the holies of holies that's the progress but that's not the way people from Rome read they are westerners the Roman community reads from the left to the right Remember what I said about Daniel and about the man with the name of John? It depends on where you're standing what it looks like. Daniel saw a lion, a bear, a leper, and a terrible beast. John the Revelator saw a terrible beast, a leper, 
a bear, and a lion. Whenever that the Hebrew entered, they came through the eastern gate and they came by the brazen altar where the lamb was slain. They came by the labor of water where the bath was taken and then they came to the holiness of God. But that's not what Cornelius saw. Cornelius was standing in the court of the Gentiles looking north and he saw the Holy Ghost before he saw water baptism. And he saw water baptism before he saw repentance. Now, how does that work, Brother Harper? Very simply this. He came in, God filled him with the Holy Ghost. Then he was baptized in water in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And his apostle to the Gentiles, by the name of the apostle Paul, writes and said that we Gentiles need to die daily. Repentance is an everyday practice in the life of the Gentile. Are y'all still with me? Now let's just get something in our minds for just a second. If the 67th most important thing that happened in the last thousand year millennium is recorded in the Look Life publication that rated the, most imp- the 100 most important things that happened in the last millennium, listed there at number 67 was the phenomena of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost in the 20th century that started in January of 1900 and continues on till today right up to the 21st century. Let me just stop and say this. Since we're dealing, everybody say dealing with. Since we're dealing with a Gentile world, doesn't it just seem like it might be the way God would propose it that Cornelius would set the standard and that is that the Gentiles would get the Holy Ghost and, well, let's just see what happens. If the, if the 20th century was for the outpouring of the Holy Ghost that today gives us almost a billion people that speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives the utterance, doesn't it just all of a sudden make sense that the 21st century must be the century for the revelation of water baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? I'll offer you an argument. Anthony, Jennifer, stand up. I'll offer you a very simple argument. See this sweet couple? They come from the church of God background. Coming from the church of God background, they came to Apostolic Life Cathedral, and they were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, received the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues. I think they received the Holy Ghost, and then they were baptized. Is that right? That's the way Gentiles do it. All right. They received the Holy Ghost, and then they were baptized in Jesus' name. Now, after Bible study, he goes home, and he starts talking to her daddy. And talking to her stepfather, I think it is. And so as he talks to his, her stepfather, his stepfather-in-law, he goes through all of the scriptures about water baptism. You may be seated. I just wanted the people to see you. They explain water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ to his stepfather-in-law. And when it gets through, he doesn't want to accept it. He wants to go talk to somebody about it. It just happens that his father is an 86-year-old retired Church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee, Holy Ghost-filled minister. Pastored churches all over southern West Virginia. And so as they enter into the conversation and his stepfather-in-law approaches his father for some ammunition so he can straighten this young man out that's got his wife going over here to this Pentecostal Jesus-named church where they got the Holy Ghost that only believes that there's one God. He looks at him and he says, give me some ammunition, Dad. And Dad said, you're not going to get any ammunition. He said, for the last 20 years, he said, I've been wanting to be baptized in water in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, it's in the Bible. And he says to them, he said, Let me ask you a question. I remembered Green Kitchen. I've heard about his son-in-law, Brother Harper. Would y'all get in touch with him and see if he'd baptize me in Jesus' name? Is that the way it happened? 
So they made arrangements with one of their friends that has a very palatial home. They didn't just have a swimming pool. They've got a saltwater swimming pool, a very nice home. And we went over there. Brother Kuntzman went out in the water. And as I stood on the banks, I said to them, upon the confession of your faith, you having received the baptism of the Holy Ghost and come to the revelation of the name of Jesus Christ and your desire to be identified with your Lord's death, burial, and resurrection, I now baptize you into the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And Brother Kuntzman put him down in the name of Jesus Christ. When he came out of the water, he just stood there trembling, 86 years old, speaking in other tongues. The reason we took him to a pool is because of the disadvantage of taking him up the steps and down into the baptistry here at the church. But he stood there. He came up and he sat down. And this is what just excites me beyond what I can tell you. He sat down on his walker. We put towels around him. He stood there with his hands raised and spoke in tongues. And then he'd praise God a while. And he would speak in tongues a while. And then he said, Brother Harper. Brother Harper, I, for the last five or six years, I've not been able to open my Bible, walk in a church house, get down to pray, or have a devotion of any kind. He said that I don't hear this voice. And this voice says to me so clearly, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name given under heaven among men whereby ye must be saved. He said today, Brother Harper, he said, I feel like I am complete. He represents to me that literally millions of charismatic believers in Jesus Christ who have received the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues that are waiting to respond to this awesome call of the name of Jesus Christ because neither is there salvation in any other. So I tell this story to my friend, Brother A.G. Lilly. I was at their homecoming down in Logan County. He said, just a minute, Brother Harper. He walked out and down the aisle and he brings a preacher in and he sets him down. He says, now, Brother Harper, tell him this story. I rehearsed it again. After I rehearsed it, the man standing there in front of me began to weep. He said, Brother Harper, I've gone to a little city down in Virginia. I went there to build a Jesus name church. I have met the pastor of the largest Baptist church in the county. And he said, we have become friends. And he said, the other day, about a month ago, I baptized him in water in the name of Jesus Christ. And he has now spent the last three weeks baptizing his entire Baptist congregation in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins. I think we got it right. If losing the glory... And crossing the river and slaying an animal is the trip out of the garden. The trip back into the garden is the Lord Jesus Christ at repentance. Being buried with him in water in baptism and receiving the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues. Beloved, it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But when he does appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Beloved, now are we become the sons of God. Well, there's a storm out on the ocean, and it's You will surely, surely drift away. Well, there's a storm out on the ocean, and it's moving this way. And if your soul's not, not anchored in Jesus, you will surely drift away. Well, there's a storm out on the ocean. You will surely drift away. 
Cause if your soul's not, not a good in Jesus. 